What I want to do today is talk about uh, the, um, the, the, the problem that I'm, uh, that I'm engaging in my current book project and specifically uh, how I want to use uh, onomastic data from the Cairo Geniza to address um, an aspect of the problem. And then I want to sort of open it up for your input as experts in this area for a little bit of help because uh, I am a you know, social economic legal historian and onomastics is moving me a little bit out of my, uh, out of my area. Let's talk about what the problem is. As uh, if you read uh, Sergio de, de la Pergola's Fundamentals of uh, Jewish Demography, uh, uh, Professor de la Pergola argues that we have roughly 90% of the Jewish world living in, uh, in Iraq at the time of the rise of Islam. And some centuries later, there's been a shift to the northern, uh, rather to the Islamic uh, um, communities of the southern Mediterranean. So the, explan the scholarly explanation of that shift from Iraq to the west is under the rise of Islam, an urbanization and a subsequent migration, right? That urbanization is as the Jews uh, take advantage of economic opportunities afforded by the new uh, um, Islamic garrison cities, such as Baghdad, and as Islamic forces unify the southern Mediterranean long distance trading opportunities. If you read uh, a book that came out in 2000 and, uh, 2013 called The Chosen Few, which was the winner for the National Jewish Book Award by Tzvi Eckstein and uh, Maristella Botticini, you see their argument that the Jews had a comparative advantage in urbanization because they could read uh, and then they moved into urban crafts and trade out of agriculture and then of course part of that trade as the southern Mediterranean opens up the, uh, the Jews take advantage of those opportunities and they move from Iraq to, uh, to the communities of the West. So the idea here is of a broad-based migration. Now, traditional sources speak of this as well. If you read the, sto uh, the story of the four captives in uh, Abraham ibn, da ibn Daoud's Sefer Kabbalah, right, and Sefer Kabbalah discusses a few rabbis who were going to uh, some kind of kala, some kind of convention, if you will, right? You have the yeshivot of, uh, of, uh, of ba Babel in Eretz Yisrael, right? These folks are captured, rabbis, and they are sold to communities in, uh, in Egypt Egypt, in Cairo and, and in, uh, in Cordoba. Now this is an explanation in Sefer Kabbalah of the, the, uh, the movement of kind of spiritual leaders, if you will, from the east to the west and the development of these communities that parallels the scholarly received wisdom of a human migration as well. Okay? Now, Onomastics are going to help us with this. This is the piece that I want to talk about today. Um, uh, Maya Schatzmiller in her book Labor in the Medieval Islamic World explains the question of migration and its impact on the size of the labor force has never been studied. There can be no doubt that considerable population movement occurred during the medieval period. Without this assumption, it's hardly possible to explain the cultural, technical, institutional, and religious unity which underlined existence in the Islamic regions. Here again, you can see she points to the unity of the, uh, of the, the uh, southern Mediterranean under Islam. Now, uh, Schatzmiller uh, cites extensively Eliyahu Ashtor's article from 1972 in Anal Analyst in which he discusses a migration from east to west, looking at Islamic chronicles, and then looking at some Geniza documents, which we'll talk about in just a moment, for the onomastic data that can be gathered there, particularly concerning the Nisba. So, names in the Islamic world break down into a number of component parts. So we have uh, Moses Maimonides, his name is Abu Imran Musa bin Maimun al-Qurtubi. Right, Abu Imran is the kunya, the nickname, uh, which is often associated, right, Abu Imran, the son of Amram, right, is often associated with the personal name or ism, Musa, right, you got the patronymic there, and then at the end, you've got this other piece called the Nisba al-Qurtubi, which in this case is a toponym referring to Cordoba, right, where the Maimonides family is from. Now, Nisbas come in a number of different forms. Some of them are topographic, some of them are also professional. Al-Attar means the, uh, the apothecary, someone who grinds up, uh, you know, substances to make drugs, whereas al-Qurtubi, that's a toponym. Okay, so what did, uh, what did Eliyahu Ashtor do? Looked at a number of uh, documents in the Cairo Geniza, about 30. Many of them were donor lists like this one here. Here we see a character named Al-Mausuli from Mosul. And then he collated the results to try and, uh, and figure out if based on dates that he assigned to documents and the locational information in the geographic toponyms, in the Nisbas, if we could figure out ebbs and flows of migration into Egypt 
using roughly these 30 documents in these, uh, these donor lists. So uh, what I've done in my study is look at the documents, not this corpus that Ashtor looked at, but the 4,300 or so documents that had been transcribed in something called the Princeton Geniza Project, uh, which takes uh, documents from the Geniza and transcribes them and makes them searchable. I have searched not just lists like this where you might see a few toponyms, right, but the corpus of those 4,300 documents and collated uh, the NISPAs from there. So let's just take a look at some of my results. I know it's going to be difficult to read. So uh, having collated the results of these 4,000 or so documents, what I did was every time I found a NISPA, I put the name in a, in a list, right, and then took the NISPA. Now, I then split all the NISPAs that I found, about 55 NISPAs, into various regions. I took uh, the, what I call the West, Islamic Spain, right, uh, Egypt itself, the Maghreb, uh, you know, Northwest Africa, uh, what I call Greater Syria, that is to say Syria, Lebanon, the land of Israel, and uh, what I call the East, which is sort of a catch-all for not only places like Baghdad, right, also Iraq itself, you have al-Iraqi, but also Habavli, al-Basri, al, al mausili and so on, but also I threw another, uh, some of the folks from, uh, uh, from uh, Yemen, uh, Aden, you know, the Red Sea port, and so on, uh, as well as a few places from, uh, from Persia, al uh, uh, Ajami, the Persian, and al Nisapure, which appears somewhere in the Geniza. But as you'll see, I then subsequently break out that group. So you've got five regions. If we look at the regions, okay, the number of instances that we find is actually the east, which Ashtor thinks there's this massive migratory movement, right, is actually the second smallest number of instances in the Geniza. Uh, Islamic Spain being, uh, being the smallest, but the, the, the largest number really is from the Maghreb and from, uh, from what I call Greater Syria. Now I just threw here so that it would be a little bit legible, uh, the sort of uh, top 20 nispas, right? Al-Andalusi, you know, appears like 48 times. Uh, I have what I hear, what I call a count here, like how many times do we see a name? And then I had to clean it because sometimes if you have uh, a, a name in the Geniza that appears twice, you can tell it's the same character, right? It could be two fragments that appeared in a single letter that then appear in the, Cairo, in the Princeton Geniza project database as two separate documents, <laughs> right? So then clearly it's the same character if the document comes from the same year and has exactly the same name, right? Name, patronymic, and nispa, okay? So I had to kind of clean the data a little bit. Um, of course, uh, you know, this cleaning isn't perfect. This is one of my problems that, uh, you know, a character sometimes is mentioned with one nispa, and sometimes is mentioned without the nispa, right? Sometimes uh, the name is spelled one way, Hillel, sometimes it's spelled with an Aleph, Hillel, right? So is that the same character? Is that not the same character? How do you know? Right? This is one of the problems that, uh, that perhaps we can engage. So again, what we have, looking at the nispas in the Princeton Ganeja Project database, that, uh, uh, that Iraq particularly has, n you know, not only not the largest number, but actually a, you know, what seems to be a pretty small number. Uh, oh, hang on. Right. There we go. Now, if we look at it sort of uh, um, graphically, right, what you can see where each of these little blocks represents 20 occurrences, that, uh, you know, the bulk sort of comes from greater Syria and Egypt and the Maghreb and uh, Al-Andalus and Iraq are actually, uh, you know, the smaller, uh, the smaller sort of numbers there. Now, what I did to try and get a picture of ebbs and flows over time, Ashtor does this as well, right? Look not only uh, in sort of 20-year bins, Ashtor looks in 50-year bins, which is fine, but then I, I, uh, I applied a little bit of smoothing to give us a 40-year moving average over uh, two of these bars, right? So this is the, the red line is a 40-year moving average, which might give you some idea of the ebbs and flows. Now, if we do this for all the different regions that I've separated the NISPAs into, right, what you see is actually the contours look kind of alike. And I also include here all the documents, right? All of the, uh, all the NISPAs put together because I was wondering about this kind of, uh, this dip around the year 1070 and concluded here, if you look at all documents, that it is a feature that affects all the documents as a whole, right? Suggesting not that, uh, 
right, that this dip that we have here is something specific to Baghdad, but rather is something that affects all this series, and therefore this perhaps says something more about the Geniza itself than it says about, uh, you know, about the, where the populations came from and about e migratory ebbs and flows. So then I have to try and find a way to graphically demonstrate, right, what that, uh, what, you know, what the ebbs and flows might look like, accounting for the fact that all documents as a whole, right, have this particular contour. So what I did uh, in order to, uh, to try and break that down is uh, to uh, look at three of these uh, segments, right, Iraq. I, I broke out the Iraqi nisbas from those that I call the East. Right, I broke out the, the Syrian piece and the Maghreb, and I looked at those as a percentage of the whole. Right? And so what this gives us is some kind of, uh, some kind of contour of, uh, you know, of what the ebbs and flows might look like based on, uh, based on those NISPAs. Right? And here, where I really had some data that was usable from about 1030 to 1230. And so what we see in the end here is that perhaps the, you know, there's, a, there's a high percentage of folks from the Maghreb uh, in, the, in the 11th century, and that might wane a little bit, that uh, perhaps Syria becomes more dominant over the course of the 11th century. But uh, Baghdad, right, from which, again, Ashtor in that 1972 article says there was a massive migration, right, really is a relatively small portion of the data that we, the NISPA data that we have from the Geniza. All right, let's talk about what the methodological problems are and how hopefully everybody here can help me. Um, number one, right, repeated uh, observations from the same NISP. I spoke about how I, can, how I dealt with that a little bit in my data set, how I tried to clean it up. Um, the dropping of NISPAs over time, right? Uh, if we have here, right, migrations from Syria, like they're in the red line, how do we know that folks didn't move from Iraq to Syria, take on a NISPA from Syria, Right? So you move from, uh, from Iraq to, to Damascus, so you're no longer al-Baghdadi, you are now al-Dimashqi, and it's that which gets recorded in the Geniza. Right? So how do you deal with that intermediate change of NISPA, or the fact that NISPAs simply drop out over time? Now it's important to note, right, NISPAs do not mean that you are from somewhere, right? For comparative information, right, this is the next steps piece here, um, I've been looking at Arabic prosopographical literature. If you look at uh, uh, prosopographical literature uh, um, surrounding scholars from the 9th century North Africa, there are sections in the prosopographical literature referring to Iraqis, but if you read the biographies of those so-called Iraqis, none of them actually went to Iraq. Right, what does it mean to be an Iraqi? It means to adhere to the Hanafi legal school, right, which is sourced in Iraq. Right? Therefore, you're someone who has an affiliation rather than a, uh, uh, an actual sort of origin in Iraq. So this is, this is a problem. So the dropping of NISPAs over time, intermediate, step, uh, intermediate steps, which would, which would change one's NISPA. Folks moved from Iraq all the way to Al-Andalus, and then they moved back. To, uh, to Egypt, right, that's a problem. Finally, selection bias within the Geniza. One thing I did not do uh, in preparing this study was go to every single document and say, where is this document from, right? But instead made the radical assumption that all documents in the Geniza were speaking about folks who were in Egypt, which of course they are not, right? Additionally, the Geniza documents, right, come from a particular stratum of society. Ashtor's study, right, came from these donor lists or from lists of charitable recipients. Right? Who is that capturing? You know, perhaps folks who were migrants were from the lower strata of society. What does that say about, you know, if you looked at the population as a whole, can you really identify a massive migration as a percentage of, uh, of the whole? Uh, and then as finally, as I said, right, the next step for my own study is to compare what I've done with the, the NISPAs from the Jewish community to the material from uh, the Arabic prosopographical literature to say, is the movement that Ashtor identifies and that I would sort of challenge here, is that same sort of movement found in the Islamic world? And if not, why is it that the Jewish community is exceptional? Um, that's, uh, that's pretty much uh, you know, uh, you know, what I want to present in terms of the project as a whole. You can see where it is. You can see some of the next steps. And hopefully there are some, uh, some insights that, uh, that the group can provide into uh, you know, not only the next steps, but also some of what I have perhaps done wrong here and how to make it better. Thank you.
have time for uh, suggestions and comments. Uh, in regard to what you uh, asked about the uh, Muslim migrations, I think that the, uh, a little bit earlier, about the uh, 7th and 8th century, you have the Ayubi um, dynasty, that um, the remnant of it that's been destroyed by the Abbasids uh, moving from our area of the country uh, to Spain and setting up the caliphate uh, in uh, Cordoba. Uh, seven, seven, I don't know, yep. seven, thirty-seven, sixty, or so, and, uh, and then the, uh, the construction of of the of the uh, uh, mixed, mixed, I think the, the mosque in, in Cordoba right. that uh, is a copy of the uh, El Aqsa here in uh, mm -hmm. in Jerusalem, so that uh, you have that group going. And the other point that I want to mention was that you also have a uh, time of Sadia. You have uh, Jews coming from the West uh, to to study in Babylon. So you have a reversal, at least on the intellectual level. And, and the primary example is uh, Dunash ibn Labrat. Comes from Fez and then and goes, travels to, to, to study with Sadia yep. uh, and then returns back again to uh, where he takes up a position in Cordoba. So uh, a couple responses. One one response to the uh, to the Umayyad migration from the from the east. It's not entirely clear that what the Umayyads are doing is engendering a tremendous human migration, so much as trying to expand the empire. Uh, or right, right. So you know, with with the rise of the Abbasids, right, there is an escape of the Umayyads. But exactly how many of the Umayyad household are escaping is right is unclear. Uh, as for uh, the idea of a move from west to east to study with Saudia, one piece that I'm working on in this book project is arguing that the intellectual influence from east to west is actually less than we might otherwise imagine. I have a piece coming out in Jerusalem Studies in Arabic and Islam, uh, which challenges the idea uh, developed by Professor Yoshua Blau and Professor Simon Hopkins that it was Saudia Gotun's translation into Judeo-Arabic of the Torah that transformed and uh, uh, systematized the spelling of Judeo-Arabic into what we see as the classical Judeo-Arabic spelling. And I argue instead it's enhanced urban-rural connections in the 10th and 11th century rather than the rise of Saadia's commentary, uh, rather Saadia's translation and its promulgation throughout the communities of the West, right? which then argues that, uh, that the intellectual influence was less than we might have otherwise imagined. Now, the movement of scholars is something that we see as I said in the Arabic prosopographical literature, uh, and so what is going on there is the Jews are doing exactly what the, is going on in the, in the Muslim community, but that is, as you say, a reversal of what Ashtor and, uh, you know, and, uh, and others, what the received wisdom is in terms of that migration westward. So thank you very much for those helpful comments.